Three women of Chuck's Donuts. The first night the man orders an apple fritter, it is three in the morning, the street lamp is broken, and California Delta mist obscures the waterfront's rundown buildings, except for Chuck's Donuts, with its cool fluorescent glow. Isn't it a bit early for an apple fritter? The owner's 12-year-old daughter, Kaylee, deadpans from behind the counter, and Tevei, for years older, rolls her eyes and says to her sister, you watch too much TV. The man ignores them both, sits down at a booth, and proceeds to stare out the window, at the busted potential of this small city's downtown. Kaylee studies the man's reflection in the window. He's older but not old, younger than her parents, and his wiry mustache seems misplaced from a different decade. His face wears an expression full of those mixed-up emotions that only adults must feel, like plaintive, say, or wretched. His light gray suit is disheveled, his tie undone. An hour passes. Kaylee whispers to Tevei, it looks like he's just staring at his own face, to which Tevei says, I'm trying to study. The man finally leaves. His apple fritter remains untouched on the table. What a trip, Kaylee says. Wonder if he's Cambodian. Not every Asian person in this city is Cambodian, Tevei says. Approaching the empty booth, Kaylee examines the apple fritter more closely. Why would you come in here, sit for an hour, and not eat? Te Tevei stays focused on the open book resting on the laminate countertop. Their mom walks in from the kitchen, holding a tray of glazed donuts. She is the owner, though she isn't named Chuck her name is Safi, and she's never met a Chuck in her life. She simply thought the name was American enough to draw customers. She slides the tray into a cooling rack, then scans the room to make sure her daughters have not let another homeless man inside. How can the street lamp be out? Safi exclaims. Again. She approaches the windows and tries to look outside, but sees mostly her own reflection stubby limbs sprouting from a grease-stained apron, a plump face topped by a cheap hairnet. This is a needlessly harsh view of herself, but Safi's perception of the world becomes distorted when she stays in the kitchen too long, kneading dough until time itself seems measured in the number of donuts produced. We will lose customers if this keeps happening. It's fine, Teve says, not looking up from her book. A customer just came in. Yeah, this weird man sat here for, like, an hour, Kaylee says. How many donuts did he buy? Safi asks. Just that, Kaylee says, pointing at the apple fritter still sitting on the table. Safi sighs. Teve, call PGNE. Teve looks up from her book. They aren't gonna answer. Leave a message, Safi says, glaring at her older daughter. I bet we can resell this apple fritter, Kaylee says. I swear, he didn't touch it. I watched him the whole time. Kay Kaylee, don't stare at customers, Safi says, before returning to the kitchen, where she starts prepping more dough, wondering yet again how practical it is to drag her daughters here every night. Maybe Chuck's Donuts should be open during normal times only, not for 24 hours each day, and maybe her daughters should go live with their father, at least some of the time, even if he can hardly be trusted after what he pulled. She contemplates her hands, the skin discolored and rough, at once wrinkled and sinewy. They are the hands of her mother, who fried homemade cha ke in the markets of Badambang until she grew old and tired, and the markets disappeared and her hands went from twisting dough to picking rice in order to serve the communist ideals of a genocidal regime. How funny, Safi thinks, that decades after the camps, she lives here in Central California, as a business owner, with her American-born Cambodian daughters who have grown healthy and stubborn, and still in this new life she has created, her hands have aged into her mother's. Weeks ago, Safi's only nighttime employee quit. Tired, he said, of her limited kitchen, of his warped sleeping schedule, of how his dreams had slipped into a deranged place. And so a deal was struck for the summer, Safi would refrain from hiring a new employee until September, and Teve and Kaylee would work alongside their mother, with the money saved going directly into their college funds. Inverting their lives, Teve and Kaylee would sleep during the hot, oppressive days, manning the cash register at night. Despite some initial indignation, Teve and Kaylee of course agreed. The first two years after it opened when Kaylee was eight, 
Teve not yet stricken by teenage resentment, and Safi still married Chuck's donuts seemed blessed with good business. Imagine the downtown streets before the housing crisis, before the city declared bankruptcy and became the foreclosure capital of America. Imagine Chuck's Donuts sur surrounded by bustling bars and restaurants and a new IMAX movie theater, all filled with people still in denial about their impossible mortgages. Consider Teve and Kaylee at Chuck's Donuts after school each day how they developed inside jokes with their mother, how they sold donuts so fast they felt like athletes, and how they looked out the store windows and saw a whirl of energy circling them. Now consider how, in the wake of learning about their father's second family, in the next town over, Teve and Kaylee cling to their memories of Chuck's Donuts. Even with the recession wiping out almost every downtown business, and driving away their nighttime customers, save for the odd worn-out worker from the nearby hospital, consider these summer nights, endless under the fluorescent lights, the family's last pillars of support. Imagine Chuck's Donuts a mausoleum to their glorious past. The second night the M.A. orders an apple fritter, he sits in the same booth. It is one in the morning, though the street lamp still emits a dark nothing. He stares out the window all the same, and once more leaves his apple fritter untouched. Three days have passed since his first visit. Kaylee crouches down, hiding behind the counter, as she watches the man through the donut display case. He wears a medium gray suit, she notes, instead of the light gray one, and his hair seems greasier. Isn't it weird that his hair is greasier than last time even though it's earlier in the night? She asks Teve, to which Teve, deep in her book, answers, that's a false causality, to assume that his hair grease is a direct result of time passing. And Kaylee responds, well, doesn't your hair get greasier throughout the day? And Teve says, you can't assume that all hair gets greasy. Like, we know your hair gets gross in the summer. And Safi, walking in, says, her hair wouldn't be greasy if she washed, washed it. She wraps her arm around Kaylee, pulls her close, and sniffs her head. You smell bad, Aun. How did I raise such a dirty daughter? She says loudly. Like mother, like daughter, Teve says, and Safi whacks her head. Isn't that a false causality? Kaylee asks. Assuming I'm like mom just because I'm her daughter. She points at her sister's book. Whoever wrote that would be ashamed of you. Teve closes her book and slams it into Kaylee's side, whereupon Kaylee digs her ragged nails into Teve's arm, all of which prompts Safi to grab them both by their wrists as she dresses them down in Khmer. As her mother's grip tightens around her wrist, Kaylee sees, from the corner of her eye, that the man has turned away from the window and is looking directly at them, all three of them acting like hotheads, as her father used to say. The man's face seems flush with disapproval, and, in this moment, she wishes she were invisible. Still gripping her daughter's wrists, Safi starts pulling them toward the kitchen's swinging doors. Help me glaze the donuts. She commands. I'm tired of doing everything. We can't just leave this man in the seating area, Kaylee protests, through clenched teeth. Safi glances at the man. He's fine, she says. He's Khmer. You don't need to drag me, Teve says, breaking free from her mother's grip, but it's too late, and they are in the kitchen, overdosing on the smell of yeast and burning air from the ovens. Safi, Teve, and Kaylee gather around the kitchen island. Trays of freshly fried dough, golden and bare, sit next to a bath of glaze. Safi picks up a naked donut and dips it into the glaze. When she lifts the donut back into the air, trails of white goo trickle off it. Kaylee looks at the kitchen doors. What if this entire time that man has, hasn't been staring out the window? She asks Teve. What if he's been watching us in the reflection? It's kind of impossible not to do both at the same time, Teve answers, and she dunks two donuts into the glaze, one in each hand. That's just so creepy, Kaylee says, an exhilaration blooming within her. Get to work, Safi snaps. Kaylee sighs and picks up a donut. Annoyed ASSHE is B. Kaylee's whims, Teve cannot deny being intrigued by the man as well. Who is he anyway? Is he so rich he can buy apple fritters only to let them sit uneaten? 
By his fifth visit, his fifth untouched apple fritter, his fifth decision to sit in the same booth, Teve finds the man worthy of observation, inquiry, and analysis a subject she might even write about for her philosophy paper. The summer class she's taking at the community college next to the abandoned mall is called Knowing. Surely writing about this man and the questions that arise when confronting him as a philosophical subject could earn Teve an A in her class, which would impress college admissions committees next year. Maybe it would even win her a fancy scholarship, allow her to escape this depressed city. Knowing initially caught Teve's eye because it didn't require any prior math classes, the coursework involved only reading, writing a 15-page paper, and attending morning lectures, which she could do before going home to sleep in the afternoon. Teve doesn't understand most of the texts, but then neither does the professor, she speculates, who looks like a homeless man the community college found on the street. Still, reading Wittgenstein is a compelling enough way to pass the dead hours of the night. Teve's philosophical interest in the man was sparked when her mother revealed that she knew, from only a glance, that he was Khmer. Like, like, how can you be sure? Kaylee whispered on the man's third visit, wrinkling her nose in doubt. Sothi finished arranging the donuts in the display case, then glanced at the man and said, of course he is Khmer. And that of course compelled Teve to raise her head from her book. Of course, her mother's condescending voice echoed, the words ping-ponging through Teve's head, as she stared at the man. Of course, of course. Throughout her 16 years of life, her parents' ability to intuit all aspects of being Khmer, or emphatically not being Khmer, has always amazed and frustrated Teve. She'd do something as simple as drink a glass of ice water, and her father, from across the room, would bellow, there were no ice cubes in the genocide. Then he'd lament, how did my kids become so not Khmer? Before bursting into rueful laughter. Other times, she'd eat a piece of dried fish or scratch her scalp or walk with a certain gait, and her father would smile and say, now I know you're Khmer. What does it mean to be Khmer anyway? How does one know what is and is not Khmer? Have most Khmer people always known, deep down, that they're Khmer? Are there feelings Khmer people experience that others don't? Variations of these questions used to flash through Teve's mind whenever her father visited them, Chuck's Donuts, back before the divorce. Carrying a container of papaya salad, he'd step into the middle of the room, and, ignoring any customers, he'd sniff his papaya salad and shout, nothing makes me feel more Khmer than the smell of fish sauce and fried dough. Being Khmer, as far as Teve can tell, can't be reduced to the brown skin, black hair, and prominent cheekbones that she shares with her mother and sister. Khmerness can manifest as anything, from the color of your cuticles to the particular way you're, but goes numb when you sit in a chair too long, and even so, Teve has recognized nothing she has ever done as being notably Khmer. And now that she's old enough to disavow, disavow her lying cheater of a father, Teve feels completely detached from what she was apparently born as. Unable to imagine what her father felt as he stood in Chuck's donut sniffing fish sauce, she can only laugh. Even now, when she can no longer stomach seeing him, she laughs when she thinks about her father. Teve carries little guilt about her detachment from her culture. At times though, she feels overwhelmed, as if her thoughts are coiling through her brain, as if her head will explode. This is what drives her to join Kaylee in the pursuit of discovering all there is to know about the man. One night, Kaylee decides that the man is the spitting image of her father. It's unreal, she argues. Just look at him, she mutters, changing the coffee filters in the industrial brewers. They have the same chin. Same hair. Same everything. Sothi, placing fresh donuts in the display case, responds, be careful with those machines. Dumbass, Teve hisses, refilling the canisters of cream and sugar. Don't you think mom would have noticed by now if he looked like dad? By this point, Sothi, Teve, and Kaylee have grown accustomed to the man's presence, aware that on any given night he might appear sometime between midnight and four. The daughters whisper about him, half hoping that where he sits is out of earshot, half hoping he'll overhear them. Kaylee speculates about his motives, if he's a police officer on a stakeout, say, or a criminal on the run. She deliberates over whether he's a good man or a bad one. 
Teve, on the other hand, theorizes about the man's purpose if, for example, he feels detached from the world and can center himself only here, in Chuck's Donuts, around other Khmer people. Both sisters wonder about his life, the kind of women he attracts and has dated, the women he has spurned, whether he has siblings or kids, whether he looks more like his mother or his father. Sathi ignores them. She is tired of thinking about other people, especially these customers from whom she barely profits. Mom, you see what I'm seeing, right? Kaylee says, to no response. You're not even listening, are you? Why should she listen to you? Teve snaps. Kaylee throws her arms up. You're just being mean because you think the man is hot, she retorts. You basically said so yesterday. You're like this gross person who thinks her dad is hot, only now you're taking it out on me. And he looks just like dad, for your information. I brought a picture to prove it. She pulls a photograph from her pocket and holds it up with one hand. Bright red sears itself onto Teve's cheeks. I did not say that, she states, and, from across the counter, she tries to snatch the photo from Kaylee, only to succeed in knocking an industrial coffee brewer to the ground. Hearing metal parts clang on the ground and scatter, Safi finally turns her attention to her daughters. What did I tell you, Kaylee? She yells, her entire face tense with anger. Why are you yelling at me? This is her fault. Kaylee gestures wildly toward her sister. Teve, seeing the opportunity, grabs the photo. Give that back to me, Kaylee demands. You don't even like dad. You never have. And Teve says, then you're contradicting yourself, aren't you? Her face still burning, she tries to recapture an even, analytic, analytical tone. So which is it? Am I in love with dad or do I, like, hate him? You are so stupid. I wasn't saying the man was hot anyway. I just pointed out that he's not, like, ugly. I'm tired of this bullshit, Kaylee responds. You guys treat me like I'm nothing. Surveying the damage her daughters have caused, Sathi snatches the photograph from Teve. Clean this mess up. She yells, and then walks out of the seating area, exasperated. In the bathroom, Safi splashes water on her face. She looks at her reflection in the mirror, noticing the bags under her eyes, the wrinkles fracturing her skin, then she looks down at the photo she's laid next to the faucet. Her ex-husband's youth taunts her with its boyish charm. She cannot imagine the young man in this image decked out in his tight polo and acid-washed jeans, high on his newfound citizenship becoming the father who has infected her daughters with so much anxious energy and who has abandoned her, middle-aged, with obligations she can barely fulfill alone. Stuffing the photo into the pocket of her apron, Sathi gathers her composure. Had she not left her daughters, she would have seen the man get up from the booth, turn to face the two girls, and walk into the hallway that leads to the bathroom. She would not have opened the bathroom door to find this man towering over her with his silent, sulking presence. And she would never have recognized it the uncanny resemblance to her ex-husband that her youngest daughter has been raving about all night. But Sathi does now register the resemblance, along with a sudden pain in her gut. The man's gaze slams into her, like a punch. It beams a focused chaos, a dim malice, and even though the man merely drifts past her, taking her place in the bathroom, Sathi can't help but think, they've come for us. Since her divorce, Sathi has worked through her days weighed down by the pressure of supporting her daughters without her ex-husband. Exhaustion grinds away at her bones. Her wrists rattle with carpal tunnel syndrome. And rest is not an option. If anything, it consumes more of her energy. A lull in her day, a moment to reflect, and the resentment comes crashing down over her. It isn't the cheating she she's mad about, the affair, her daughter's frivolous stepmother, who calls her with misguided attempts at reconciliation. Her attraction to her ex-husband, and his to her, dissolved at a steady rate after her first pregnancy. The same cannot be said of their financial contract. That imploded spectacularly. Her daughters have no idea, 
but when Safi opened Chuck's Donuts it was with the help of a generous loan from her ex-husband's distant uncle, an influential business tycoon based in Phnom Penh with a reputation for funding political corruption. She'd heard wild rumors about this uncle, even here in California that he was responsible for the imprisonment of the prime minister's main political opponent, that he'd gained his riches by joining a criminal organization of ex, Khmer Rouge officials, and that he'd arranged, on behalf of powerful and petty Khmer Rouge sympathizers, the murder of Hang S. Inger. Safi didn't know if she wanted to accept the uncle's money, to be indebted to such dark forces, to commit to a life in which she would always be afraid that hit men disguised as Khmer American gangbangers might gun her and her family down, and then cover it up as a simple mugging gone wrong. If even Hang S. Inger, the Oscar-winning movie star of The Killing Fields, wasn't safe from this fate, if he couldn't escape the spite of the powerful, how could Safi think that her own family would be spared? Then again, what else was Safi supposed to do? Do, with a GED, a husband who worked as a janitor, and two small children? How else could she and her husband stimulate their dire finances? What skills did she have, other than frying dough? Deep down, Safi has always understood that it was a bad idea to get into business with her ex-husband's uncle, who, for all she knew, could have bankrolled Pol Pot's coup. And so, now, seeing the man's resemblance to her ex-husband, she wonders if he could be some distant gangster cousin. She fears that her past has finally caught up with her. For several days, the man does not visit Chuck's Donuts. But Safi's worries only deepen. They root themselves into her bones. Her daughter's constant musings about the man only intensify her suspicion that he is a relative of her former uncle-in-law. He has come to take their lives, to torture the money out of them, perhaps to hold her daughters as collateral, investments to sell on the black market. Still, she can't risk being impulsive, lest she provoke him. And there's the possibility, of course, that he's a complete stranger. Surely he would have harmed them by now. Why this performance of waiting? She keeps herself on guard, tells her daughters to be wary of the man, to call for her if he walks through the door. Tevi has started writing her philosophy paper, and Kaylee is helping her. On whether being Khmer means you understand Khmer people, the paper is tentatively titled. Tevi's professor requires students to title their essays in the style of uncertainty, as if starting a title with the word on makes it philosophical. She decides to structure her paper as a catalog of assumptions made about the man based on the idea that he is Khmer, and that the persons making these assumptions Teve and Kaylee are also Khmer. Each assumption will be accompanied by a paragraph discussing the validity of the assumption, which will be determined based on the answers provided by the man to questions that Teve and Kaylee will ask him directly. Both Teve and, and Kaylee agree to keep the nature of the paper secret from their mother. The sisters spend several nights refining their list of assumptions about the man. Maybe he also grew up with parents who never liked each other, Kaylee says one night when the downtown appears less bleak, the dust and pollution lending the dark sky a red glow. Well, it's not like Khmer people marry for love, Teve responds. Kaylee looks out the window for anything worth observing, but sees only the empty street, a corner of the old downtown motel, the dull orange of the Little Caesars, which her mother hates because the manager won't allow her customers to park in his excessively big lot. It just seems like he's always looking for someone, you know? Kaylee says. Maybe he loves someone, but that person doesn't love him back. Do you remember what dad said about marriage? Teve asks. He said that, after the camps, people paired up based on their skills. Two people who knew how to cook wouldn't marry, because that would be, like, a waste. If one person in the marriage cooked, then the other person should know how to sell food. He said marriage is like the show Survivor, where you make alliances in order to live longer. He thought Survivor was actually the most Khmer thing possible, and he would definitely win it, because the genocide was the best training he could have got. What were their skills? Kaylee asks. Moms and dads? The answer to that question is probably the reason they didn't work out, Tevi says. What does this have to do with the man? Kaylee asks. And Tevi responds, well, if Khmer people marry for skills, as dad says, maybe it means it's harder for Khmer people to know how to love. 
Maybe we're just bad at it loving, you know, and maybe that's the man's problem. Have you ever been in love? Kaylee asks. No, Teve says, and they stop talking. They can hear their mother cooking in the kitchen, the routine clanging of mixers and trays, a string of sounds that just fails to coalesce into melody. Teve wonders if her mother has ever loved someone romantically, if her mother is even capable of reaching beyond the realm of survival, if her mother has ever been granted any freedom from worry, and if her mother's present carries the ability to dilate, for even a brief moment, into its own plane of suspended existence, separate from past or future. Kaylee, on the other hand, wonders if her mother misses her father, and, if not, whether this means that Kaylee's own feelings of gloom, of isolation, of longing, are less valid than she believes. She wonders if the violent chasm between her parents also exists within her own body, because isn't she just a mix of all those antithetical genes? Mom should start smoking, Kaylee says. And Teve asks, why? It'd force her to take breaks, Kaylee says. Every time she wanted to smoke, she'd stop working, go outside, and smoke. Depends on what would kill her faster, Teve says. Smoking or working too much? Then Kaylee asks, softly, do you think dad loves his new wife? Teve answers, he better. Here's how Sothi and HRX husband were supposed to handle their deal with the uncle. Every month, Sothi would give her then-husband 20% of Chuck's Donuts profits. Every month, her then-husband would wire that money to his uncle. And every month, they would be one step closer to paying off their loan before anyone with ties to criminal activity could bat an eyelash. Here's what actually happened. One day, weeks before she discovered that her husband had conceived two sons with another woman while they were married, Sothi received a call at Chuck's Donuts. It was a man speaking in Khmer, his accent thick and pure. At first, Sothi hardly understood what he was saying. His sentences were too fluid, his pronunciation too proper. He didn't truncate his words, the way so many Khmer American immigrants did, and Sothi found herself lulled into a daze by those long-lost syllables. Then she heard what the man's words actually meant. He was the accountant of her husband's uncle. He was asking about their loan, whether they had any intention of paying it back. It had been years and the uncle hadn't received any payments, the accountant said with menacing regret. Sothi later found out from her husband's guilt-stricken mistress, of all people that her husband had used the profits she'd given him, the money intended to pay off their loan, to support his second family. In the divorce settlement, Sothi agreed not to collect child support, in exchange for sole ownership of Chuck's Donuts, for custody of their daughters, and for her ex-husband's promise to talk to his uncle, and to eventually pay off their loan, this time with his own money. He had never intended to cheat his uncle, he proclaimed. He had simply fallen in love with another woman. It was true love. What else could he do? And of course, he had an obligation to his other children, the sons who bore his name. Still, he promised to right this wrong. But how can Safi trust her ex-husband? Will a man sent by the uncle one day appear at her doorstep, or at Chuck's Donuts, or in the alley behind Chuck's Donuts, and right their wrong for them? A promise is a promise, yet, in the end, it is only that. An entire week has PASSE'd since the man's last visit. Safi's fears have begun to wane. There are too many donuts to make, too many bills to pay. It helped, too, when she called her ex-husband to yell at him. You selfish pig of a man, she said. You better be paying your uncle back. You better not put your daughters in danger. You better not be doing the same things you've always done thinking only about yourself and what you want. I can't even talk to you right now. If your uncle sends someone to collect money from me, I will tell him how disgraceful you are. I will tell him how to find you, and then you'll face the consequences of being who you are, who you've always been. Remember, I know you better than anyone. She hung up before he could respond, and even though this call hasn't gained her any real security, she feels better. She almost wants the man to be a hit man sent by the uncle, so that she can direct him straight to her ex-husband. Not that she wants her ex-husband to be killed. But she does want to see him punished. 
The night the man returns, Sathi, Tevei, and Kaylee are preparing a catering order for the hospital three blocks over. Sathi needs to deliver a hundred donuts to the hospital before 11.30. The gig pays good money, more money than Chuck's donuts has made all month. Sathi would rather not leave her daughters alone, but she cannot send them to deliver the donuts. She'll be gone only an hour. And what can happen? The man never shows up before midnight, midnight, anyway. Just in case, she decides to close the store during her delivery. Keep this door locked while I'm gone, she tells her daughters after loading her car. Why are you so insecure about everything? Tevei says. And Kaylee says, we're not babies. Sathi looks them in the eyes. Please be safe. The door is locked, but the owner's daughters are clearly inside, you can see them through the illuminated windows, sitting at the counter. So the man stands at the glass door and waits. He stares at the daughters until they notice a shadow in a suit hovering outside. The man waves for them to let him enter, and Kaylee says to her sister, weird it looks like he's been in a fight. And Teve, noticing the man's messy hair and haunted expression, says, we need to interview him. She hesitates just a moment before unlocking the door, cracking it open. In flames scratches crisscross his neck. Smudges of dirt model his wrinkled white shirt. I need to get inside, he says gravely. It's the only thing Teve has heard him say other than I'll have an apple fritter. Our mom told us not to let anyone in, Teve says. I need to get inside, the man repeats, and who is Teve to ignore the man's sense of purpose? Fine, Teve says, but you have to let me interview you for a class assignment. She looks him over again, considers his bedraggled appearance. And you still need to buy something. The man nods and Teve opens the door for him. As he crosses the threshold, dread washes over Kaylee as she becomes aware of the fact that she and her sister know nothing at all about the man. All their deliberations concerning his presence have gotten them nowhere, really, and right now the only things Kaylee truly knows are, she is a child, her sister is not quite an adult, and they are betraying their mother's wishes. Soon Teve and Kaylee are sitting across from the man in his booth. Scribbled notes and an apple fritter are laid out between them on the table. The man stares out the window, as always, and, as always, the sisters study his face. Should we start? Teve asks. The man says nothing. Teve tries again. Can we start? Yes, we can start, the man says, still staring out into the dark night. The interview begins with the question your Khmer, right? And then a pause, a consideration. Teve meant this to be a softball question, a warm-up for her groundbreaking points of investigation, but the man's silence unnerves her. Finally, the man speaks. I am from Cambodia, but I'm not Cambodian. I'm not Khmer. And Teve, feeling sick to her stomach, asks, wait, what do you mean? She looks at her notes, but they aren't any help. She looks at Kaylee, but she isn't any help either. Her sister is as confused as she is. My family is Chinese, the man continues. For several generations, we've married Chinese Cambodians. Okay, so you are Chinese ethnically, and not Khmer ethnically, but you're still Cambodian, right? Teve asks. Only I call myself Chinese, the man answers. But your family has lived in Cambodia for generations? Kaylee interjects. Yes. And you and your family survived the Khmer Rouge regime? Teve asks. Again, the man answers, yes. So do you speak Khmer or Chinese? The man answers, I speak Khmer. Do you celebrate Cambodian New Year? Again, the man answers, yes. Do you eat rotten fish? Kaylee asks. Prahak? The man asks. Yes, I do. Do you buy food from the Khmer grocery store or the Chinese one? Teve asks. The man answers, Khmer. What's the difference between a Chinese family living in Cambodia and a Khmer family living in Cambodia? Teve asks. Aren't they both still Cambodian? If they both speak Khmer, 
if they both survive the same experiences, if they both do the same things, wouldn't that make a Chinese family living in Cambodia somewhat Cambodian? The man, man doesn't look at Teve or Kaylee. Throughout the interview, his eyes have searched for something outside. My father told me that I am Chinese, the man answers. He told me that his sons, like all other sons in our family, should marry only Chinese women. Well, what about being American? Teve asks. Do you consider yourself American? The man answers, I live in America, and I am Chinese. So you don't consider yourself Cambodian at all? Kaylee asks. He turns his gaze away from the window. For the first time in their conversation, he considers the sisters who are sitting across from him. You two don't look Khmer, he says. You look like you have Chinese blood. How can you tell? Teve asks, startled, her cheeks burning. The man answers, it's in the face. Well, we are, Teve says. Khmer, I mean. And Kaylee says, actually, I think mom said once that her great-grandfather was Chinese. Shut up, Teve says. And Kaylee responds, God, I was just saying. The man stops looking at them. We're done here. I need to focus. But I haven't asked my real questions, Teve protests. The man says, one more question. Why do you never eat the apple fritters you buy? Kaylee blurts out, before Teve can even glance at her notes. I don't like donuts, the man answers. The conversation comes to a halt, as Teve finds this latest answer the most convincing argument the man has made for not being Khmer. You can't be serious, Kaylee says after a moment. Then why do you buy so many apple fritters? The man doesn't answer. His eyes straining, he leans even closer to the window's surface, almost grazing the glass with his nose. Teve looks down at the backs of her hands. She examines the lightness of her brown skin. She remembers how in elementary school she always got so mad at the white kids who misidentified her as Chinese, sometimes even getting into fights with them on the bus. And she remembers her father consoling her in his truck at the bus stop. I know I joke around a lot, he said once, his hand on her shoulder. But you are Khmer, through and through. You should know that. Teve examines the man's reflection. His vision of the world disappoints her the idea that people are limited always to what their fathers tell them. Then Teve notices her sister reeling in discomfort. No, Kaylee says, hitting the table with her fists. You have to have a better answer than that. You can't just come in here almost every night, order an apple fritter, not eat it, and then tell us you don't like donuts. Breathing heavily, Kaylee leans forward, the edge of the table cutting into her ribs. Kaylee, Teve says, concerned. What's going on with you? Be quiet. The man yells abruptly, still staring out the window, violently swinging his arm. Shocked into a frozen silence, the sisters don't know how to respond and can only watch as the man stands up, clenching his fists, and charges into the center of the seating area. Right then, a woman probably Khmer, or maybe Chinese-Cambodian, or maybe just Chinese bursts into Chuck's donuts and starts striking the man with her purse. So you're spying on me? The woman screams. She is covered in bruises, the sisters see, her left eye nearly swollen shut. They stay in the booth, pressed against the cold cold glass of the window. You beat your own wife, and you spy on her, she says, now battering the man, her husband, with slaps. You're. The man tries to push his wife away, but she hurls her body into his, and then they are on the ground, the woman on top of the man, slapping his head over and over again. You're scum, you're scum, the woman shrieks, and the sisters have no idea how to stop the violence that is unfolding before them, or whether they should try. They cannot even say whom they feel aligned with the man, to whose presence they have grown attached, or the bruised woman, whose explosive anger toward the man appears warranted. They remember those punctuated moments of Chuck's Donuts past, before the recession forced people into paralysis, when the dark energy of their city barreled into the fluorescent seating area. They remember the drive-by gang shootings, the homeless men lying in the alley in heroin-induced comas, the robberies of neighboring businesses, 
and even if Chuck's Donuts once, they remember how, every now and then, they panicked that their mother wouldn't make it home. They remember the underbelly of their glorious past. The man is now on top of the woman. He screams, you've betrayed me. He punches her face. The sisters shut their eyes and wish for the man to go away, and the woman too. They wish this couple had never set foot in Chuck's Donuts, and they keep their eyes closed, holding each other, until suddenly they hear a loud blow, then another, followed by a dull thud. Their eyes flick open to find their mother helping the woman sit upright. On the ground lies a cast iron pan, the one that that's used when the rare customer orders an egg sandwich, and beside it, unconscious, the man, blood leaking from his head. Brushing hair out of the woman's face, their mother consoles this stranger. Their mother and the woman remain like this for a moment, neither of them acknowledging the man on the ground. Still seated in the booth with Kaylee clutching her, Teve thinks about the signs, all the signs there have been not to trust this man. She looks down at the ground, at the blood seeping onto the floor, how the color almost matches the red laminate of the countertops. She wonders if the man, in the unconscious layers of his mind, still feels Chinese. Then Safi asks the woman, are you okay? But the woman, struggling to stand up, just looks at her husband. Again, Safi asks, are you okay? Fuck, the woman says, shaking her head. Fuck, fuck, fuck. It's all right, Safi says, reaching to touch her, but the woman is already rushing out the door. Emotion drains out of Safi's face. She is stunned by this latest abandonment, speechless, and so is Teve, but Kaylee calls after the woman, yelling, even though it's too late, you can't just leave. And then Safi bursts into laughter. She knows that this isn't the appropriate response, that it will leave her daughters more disturbed, just as she knows that there are so many present liabilities for instance, the fact that she has severely injured one of her own customers and not even to protect her children from a vicious gangster. But she can't stop laughing. She can't stop thinking of the absurdity of this situation, how if she were in the woman's shoes she also would have fled. Finally, Safi calms herself. Help me clean this up, she says, facing her daughters, giving the slightest of nods toward the man on the ground, as though he were any other mess. Customers can't see blood so close to the donuts. Both Safi and Tevi agref at Kaylee is too young to handle blood, so while her mother and sister prop the man up against his booth and begin cleaning the floors, Kaylee calls 911 from behind the counter. She tells the operator that the man is unconscious, that he's taken a hit to the head, and then recites the address of Chuck's Donuts. You're very close to the hospital, the operator responds. Can't you take him over yourself? Kaylee hangs up and says, we should drive him to the hospital ourselves. Then, watching her mother and sister, she asks, aren't we supposed to not, you know, mess with a crime scene? And Safi answers sternly, we didn't kill him. Balancing herself against the donut display case, Kaylee watches her mother and sister mop the floor, the man's blood dissolving into pink suds of soap, and then into nothing. She thinks about her father. She wants to know whether he ever hit her mother, and if so, whether her mother ever hit him back, and whether that's the reason her mother so naturally came to the woman's defense. As Teve wipes away the last trails of red, she too, thinks of their father, but she recognizes that even if their father had been violent with their mother it wouldn't answer, fully, any questions concerning her parents' relationship. What concerns Teve more is the validity of the idea that every Khmer woman or just every woman has to deal with someone like their father, and what the outcome is of this patient, or desperate, dealing. Can the very act of enduring result in wounds that bleed into a person's thoughts, Teve wonders, distorting how that person experiences the world? Only Safi's mind stays free of her daughter's father. She considers instead the woman whether her swollen eye and bruises will heal completely, whether she has anyone to care for her. Safi pities the woman. Even though she's afraid that the man will now sue her, that the police will not believe her side of the story, she feels grateful that she is not the woman. She understands, more than ever, how lucky she is to have rid her family of her ex-husband's presence. Safi drops her mop back into its yellow bucket. Let's take him to the hospital. Everything's gonna be okay, right? Kaylee asks. 
And Teve responds, well, we can't just leave him here. Stop fighting and help me, Sathi says, walking over to the man. She carefully lifts him up, then wraps his arm around her shoulders. Teve and Kaylee rush to the man's other side and try to do the same. Outside, the street lamp is still broken, but they have grown used to the darkness. Struggling to keep the man upright, they lock the door, roll down the steel shutters, whose existence they'd almost forgotten about, for once securing Chuck's donuts from the world. Then they drag the man's heavy body toward their parked car. The man, barely conscious, begins to groan. The three women of Chuck's Donuts have a variation of the same thought. This man, they realize, didn't mean much at all to them, lent no greater significance to their pain. They can hardly believe they've wasted so much time wondering about him. Yes, they think, we know this man. We've carried him our whole lives.